While we are at Comedy Podcast here at Tiger Crisis, we wanted to say very sincerely that if you are suffering from mental health, that we understand where you're coming from and we appreciate you and we don't want to make light of anyone who has harmed themselves at any point during their life or has known anybody who has harmed themselves. Some of the things that happen in the episodes of Tiger King uh, end up being a result of self-harm and suicide and we want to be sensitive to those things and want to make clear that we're not making light of any of those things that the documentary itself does not maybe delve deep enough into those issues and for sure the main character joe exotic in no way is sensitive to suicide mental health and anything in that realm but we wanted to say here at tiger crisis as a podcast are very very serious about mental health and if you yourself uh, have any thoughts or are having trouble to look up your local NAMI branch, N-A-M-I, the National Association of Mental uh, Illness, uh, please look, ask, and reach for help. Uh, also find your local suicide hotline if necessary. Uh, once again, we wanted to make sure that we're clear that we are very, very serious about mental health here at the podcast. And anything that we say about the uh, Travis incident and suicide is in no way meant to be um, soft or insensitive. Thank you guys so much. Hello, folks. Tiger King, the podcast. Uh, talking about uh, episode five. We're calling our podcast Tiger Crisis. Thank you guys for listening and watching. Uh, we wanted to apologize for uh, our late content last week. I found myself in the emergency room for a non-coronavirus emergency. I'm better. Thank you for your concern. Um, but we didn't do a great job because uh, I was in the ER until 5, 6 in the morning on uh, Thursday night. But I uh, appreciate your concern and all your love. Uh, let's, let's get into it. Let's talk about uh, Tiger King on Netflix, Episode 5. Ah. So Tiger King, uh, Episode 5 on uh, the Netflix special. Uh, really goes into the details of what happens, everything after the Jeff Lowe situation with Joe Exotic. What I found uh, particularly interesting was that the episode four of the of uh, episode four of the documentary made it pretty clear that we needed to be on Joe Exotic's side. He really is the the main character. He is the Tiger King. He's the namesake of the show. And we're supposed to love him. And if you don't love him, then you, there's, you know, there's consequences as a viewer. Uh, so there's something there's something great about that. And that's um, that's sort of the takeaway of that episode. This episode, we jump right into everything about how Jeff Lowe takes over the, the GW Zoo and then starts hiring all of his cronies, most of which have no uh, abilities, interests or history working with animals. He basically hires a bunch of misfits, almost in the same in the same realm that that Joe does. He hires these people um, who have no background, no experience, and really have nowhere else to go. Um, the episode five of the of uh, Tiger King is called "Make America Exotic Again," which really proves, I think, uh, an assertion that I made earlier on in this podcast, which is. Joe Exotic, in a way, sets the stage for the shenanigans of the Trump presidency. The, the, the fact that it is okay to be entertainment only as a candidate. Because this episode, Joe, very early on, starts running for president. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. Joe has started a pizza place where he, uh, where he serves the, the Walmart meat on the, on the thing. He starts running for president. He's putting out these wild videos. Obviously, he doesn't get a serious look at the presidential election of that year. Uh, so then he starts running for governor of Oklahoma. And my favorite part of this episode is that uh, we find out that his campaign manager, who who's talking with the same level of confidence as everyone else in this show, was a Walmart manager of the ammo section. And he met Joe because Joe was in there buying explosives all the time. And apparently this guy had some political information 
and more than Joe. And so that's the first guy that Joe knew, and he offered him the job. This is what's great about Joe. Joe, in, in, a, in, in a very fun and friendly way, Basically, if you know anything about anything, you get to be Joe's guy. Like he he met this guy uh, uh, Kirkham who had some experience working in television, and then he goes, "You know what? You can run my television station. I got a television station." He wants to own tigers, and he meets some people. He says, "You know what? You uh, once had a pet cat, so you can be my zoo manager. Uh, you guy who broke his legs in a zipline accident. You seem to be a hardworking guy. You can uh, be my assistant manager for the zoo." Um, Joe starts handing out condoms with his face on them. He starts running in the Libertarian Party. His his um, his campaign strategy is worrying about uh, anti bullying, anti cyber bullying. Meanwhile, he's putting out videos all the while saying "fuck Carol Baskin and her uh, and her." you know, her plans for the world. So he's cyber bullying Carol Baskin all the while he's running around town telling people that he's running for governor and there's got 227 tigers. <clears throat> Another thing I picked up on in this episode that was very interesting, once you start really running down the line with what happens throughout the entire show. Number one, uh, Carol has is, is, is quoted once again uh, in this weird, like, misunderstanding of how she's going to be portrayed eventually she's quoted again about ways to kill people with tigers it's like lady if you're if you're gonna put yourself in a situation all the time then you can't be surprised that people think that you killed your husband and fed him to the tigers since he disappeared and you took all of his money he disappeared you took all of his money and you own a bunch of tigers it just makes sense it was a plot line in snatch okay they weren't tigers they were they were they were uh pigs but that's the point you don't feed a tiger for a couple of days he'll fucking eat through your bones it's just the way it is. So in this episode, we get sort of the only lit, the, the only look besides, I guess, Saf. I guess Saf gets her arm eaten off. But then we get the only other look at a potential uh, tiger attack, which is when Joe's trying to do one of his campaign videos. And the tiger starts chewing on his foot. And I'm not sure which animal it was because it was uh, uh, it's a tiger that actually had leopard spots. So it's 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 obviously some hybrid of animal that we have going on. And Joe starts, son of a bitch, and I'm going to shoot you between your eyes and doing all the Joe stuff. And then Carol gets quoted in this whole process about uh, if somebody wants to kill you with a tiger, uh, they'll put sardine oil on you, which, again, don't do that. If you're Carol and you are going to be in at some point in the documentary uh, question. Look, at this point in Carol's life, she knows that people think that she maybe killed somebody. So don't go on record anywhere saying that if you wanted to kill somebody with uh, a tiger, then you would do A, B, C, or D. Just don't do it. It's dumb. It's like when O.J. Simpson put out that book about how I would do it if I was going to do it. It's just not a good way to do it. Now, again, I'm assuming we've all watched ahead. If you haven't watched ahead, you can cover yours for a second. But uh, one of the characters that Jeff Lowe hires to to work at the zoo who doesn't have any idea with what he's doing is, guy, is a guy by the name of Alan. Now, if we watch ahead in the documentary, we find out that Alan is the guy that supposedly is hired by Joe to kill Carol. And the whole thing is fishy later on. And the whole Jeff Lowe thing is fishy because uh, as we come out of episode four, we find that Jeff Lowe sort of tries to swoop in and be this big benefactor only to then take over the zoo um, once they put it in his name and Joe dissolves his company. Joe has no more claim to the GW Zoo and it starts to tank. And then Jeff's story is sort of this idea that like, hey, listen, you can't use the zoo to finance your campaign, this and that and the other thing. But basically it's two uh, people that think they have big dicks running around and they can't find a way to coexist. So Alan spends a good portion of this episode talking about how disrespectful Joe is, how he's worked for all these people and nobody's ever treated him this way and how he hates Joe and how, uh, you know, he's telling Jeff Lowe, hey, Joe's underneath me when I'm cutting down the street and I accidentally dropped his chainsaw on him. All of this stuff uh, is, again, on record on this show. It's on, like, there's no, nobody's twisting your words. People go on reality shows and they get mad because they got uh, portrayed in a certain way. You didn't get portrayed a certain way. You said, fuck Carol Baskin, so now that's what we think that you think, right? You go on a reality television show, you don't want to be portrayed a certain way, don't say the thing. Uh, and uh, An associate producer is going to try to make you say the thing, 
don't say the thing. I went on a limit date, uh, and all they wanted for the last scene of a limit date, once I got eliminated, was for me to talk shit about this Daniel LaRusso fucking Mr. Miyagi accented dude who just got my girl. And I wouldn't do, I'm doing it now, but I wouldn't do it then uh, because I knew it was going to be this sad shot, me in the rain talking shit about uh, the vindiction of being eliminated. I was like, no, if this woman likes this guy, she should totally go for it. Good for her. And God bless her for finding a, a mate that she was interested. So that's my point is these guys are on camera saying things that they do feel otherwise they wouldn't have said them no one's no one's coaxing you to say that joe is the most disrespectful person on the planet that you don't want to be near him that you hate him so my point is from a plot hole perspective joe's in prison for hiring alan a guy who doesn't respect him to murder murder carol baskin who only joe has a problem with so none of that really ends up adding up if you start to really break apart the episodes and watch the season twice which i've had to do for this uh podcast uh so that is an interesting thing that i pick out of this episode alan has no interest in being friends with joe has no interest in doing joe any favors um, and, and as we find out later, the money thing doesn't, there's no real way to prove that. So it's very implausible that this is a thing. So let's fast forward to the episode where he, where Joe gets, uh, dragged out by the cat. I don't know how many people that listen to this have cats, understand cats. I'm afraid of cats. I have this fact in my head. I know it to be true that if, uh, if you die, your cat's going to eat your face. That's enough for me. That's enough for me to not ever get a cat, right? Like, cause how do you know that your cat has any ability to read vital signs? Like, what if you just pass out? What if you just like are prone to seizures? Will your cat like eat your nose while you're like taking a nap? You're going to wake up and like part of your face is eaten. I don't want to get involved in it, but here's what I know for sure about cats uh when you get more than one cat they become um like more trusting of each other as a uh, as as a perspective of like authority than they do of humans so i've been in situations where me and my dog are visiting people my dog is very passive very much afraid of cats will avoid a cat at all costs and i was in situations where a cat decided that because Tess was there and uncomfortable and making everyone uncomfortable with her weird, like, creepy uh, dog, don't attack me vibes, that they would attack. So then this one cat attacks my dog, Tess, and then the other three cats piled on because of the situation. Now, Tess at no point was an aggressor in this thing. In fact, she screamed her way out of it, and we got the cats off of her. Um, but that's sort of what's about to happen in the Joe situation. And I think he understands enough about being around tigers and lions and all these things that once this cat drags him across the, the plane there, that the other tigers are starting to like arc up and be ready to just hit, like come in and rip him apart because he pulls out his gun that he claimed earlier on in episodes that he would never shoot a cat. By the way, he does not shoot a cat, but he pulls out his gun and he fires it off once or twice to get the cats away. But his original intention was that, look, I, the only reason I have this gun is for people. But we saw very clearly the first time he gets into some trouble, he fires the gun off near the cat's ear to kind of scare him off and get himself back in a situation. But if you watch the scene, you can see very clearly that Joe is freaking out and that the other tigers around in that cage are like slowly creeping in and then as joe sort of limps off and tries to get himself out of there he can feel the other cats sort of like now in three in a line slowly creeping up on him so he was legit 15 or 16 seconds away from death uh so that was interesting it's an interesting culmination of events that all sort of show up in episode five which is a weird like conglomeration of a bunch of things so we come into the episode talking about joe's run for governor and how he lost sight of being uh part of the the like the manager of the zoo but at the same time we know that jeff Lowe has taken over the zoo so that's sort of weird and then we go right into this other big plot point, which which is like a, a jaw dropping thing. This is when we find out that Joe Finley, um, excuse me, John Finley and Travis, who are Joe Exotic's two husbands, who two polygamous husbands, we find out that neither one of them are gay. And uh, from an account from mul multiple people in the. Uh, in the zoo, like Travis was banging every girl in the park and John Finley ends up marrying one of the secretaries of the park. 
and they got both, well, he got one of these guys on interview talking about how he dated girls all through high school and uh, and then he impregnated this woman. So there's, uh, and we put out, we're putting out a, a separate episode that is a debate episode that is about whether or not you could marry someone uh, or be with somebody that you're not attracted to. Because this is the thing, we got, we got Travis and John who just straight up aren't attracted to men, let alone Joe Exotic. And for the comfort of the zoo, uh, for the comfort of the meth, for the comfort of tigers and a job, they enter these the, these marriages and are pretty like fine with things. Um, I know there is some strife. It does seem like at certain points John and Travis are not having the best time, but I think that's a lot of relationships. Uh, but let's take it to the extreme now. Let's talk about it. John obviously ends up marrying this lady, the secretary, and impregnating her and, and, and getting back his original um, claim to his own sexuality. Travis, on the other hand, we find, uh, commits suicide in the park. And oddly enough, we've, we crammed like um, what looks like two years worth of like Travis strife footage into one like four minute run of Travis punching out uh a um like a what's it called like a like a tractor trailer like the trailer part of a tractor trailer and then Travis complaining that Joe doesn't listen to him and this is all sort of amongst the uh presidential campaign and the governor campaign Travis who by all accounts is not gay starts to feel neglected by Joe and this tends to be enough, apparently, for him to take his own life uh, because we, we have this horrifying footage of Travis uh, being watched by who, this, uh, this guy whose name I, uh, escapes me, who is the, um, the, the campaign manager. He's watching, and then we see the flash go off, and this guy just sort of staring at this flash for what is like three minutes of real time um so obviously something is not right in the travis and joe scenario um but it sounds like the 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 main aspects of the relationship had nothing to do with being attracted to one another and just uh, sort of all the other comforts and the attention and i think there is something to be said about the fact that we can all go a long way in a relationship if we feel appreciated if we feel valuable if we feel uh, like like our needs are being met, which in this case, again, there's meth, food, job, tigers. Uh, maybe we can we can carry out a relationship in that way. I think a lot of us understand and know and have seen many relationships that probably are not uh, smoking hot sexually and uh, and are not very physical relationships. And I think that's just somehow what we've decided is okay uh, as people. I think I think we even think, that if the relationship is all touchy-feely and crazy sexual, that that is actually an unhealthy relationship. So I think we have a weird view about relationships. And the Travis, John, Joe scenario really brings it to light that uh, attraction might be so low on the list of necessities in a relationship that you could actually not at all be physically attracted to your partner in the fact that you might be attracted to a completely different gender and still marry that person and you know let's uh let's let's not go too far down this path but obviously there are have been many homosexual people that have married straight people over the years because of uh persecution and fear and prejudice and all these other th and weird laws um so it's not the craziest thing that you could marry somebody who has a gender that you don't want to bang. Um, that being said, there also is, uh, there's enough on everybody that um, that you can figure it out. Let's just go there. Um, but what else? It seems like if you have tigers, the, the claim in this documentary seems to be that if you have tigers, you can find people that want to bang you. Uh, and you can find people to bang you that might not want to bang you. We find out. So there is something fun about that. Um, now, Joe... I, the internet is exploding with the Joe memes and all this sort of thing that uh, when he wears these crazy outfits. So when Saf got her arm eaten off, Joe was right behind her wearing a uh, paramedic's uniform and everybody on the internet thought that was fantastic. Uh, in the same way, Joe shows up at the funeral 
Travis's funeral, Travis's suicide funeral, Joe shows up in full black with the priest like little white garb. I don't know what you call that thing, but the little, the little priest tie. So he's dressed fully as a priest and he makes a real spectacle of it. He's he's the only official at the at the um at the funeral and it's like it's sort of like it looks like a low budget wedding. It's like rented chairs that are underneath some sort of gazebo at the zoo and he's up there telling jokes and singing songs and telling stories about Travis running around teabagging people while Travis's mom is in the front row. Um, so we get to Travis's mom, and she's sort of nodding out from her meth habit, and she's devastated that this is how Joe handled the funeral situation. Um, and then two months after the funeral, we see that Joe gets remarried to a guy named Dylan and brings Travis's mom to the funeral, or excuse me, to the new wedding, um, just to like prove to the internet that everybody's happy and that everything's fine. And then the end of episode five is this Jeff Lowe being interviewed while taking fake phone calls. He like he basically keeps picking up the phone and telling anybody who will listen that Joe has been interviewed by uh, FBI agents and federal officials. And you can hear the person on the other end of the phone. They're like, I gotta go. Like they're not listening to him. So. The documentary filmmaker gets all bent out of shape and ends up in the car filming himself talking about how Jeff spent all afternoon on the phone with officials who are apparently coming for Joe. Um, So this whole part of the episode, episode five, feels really shady, feels really forced. Again, as a documentary filmmaker, your job is to, um, to lead someone down a path, but to tell the story in a way that makes the audience think that they're coming up with their own impression of people. So one of the, uh, the documentaries I recently watched was about an older Jewish couple who ends up purchasing and running a um, gay bookstore in Los Angeles for like 35 years and they were like dead center for uh, the, the the big trials on um, uh, uh, obscenity that involved uh, all the pornographers and they were involved in basically like the coming out scene of Los Angeles from like the 70s through the 2000s so they were a big part of this thing and what the documentary filmmaker does do in that um in, in that documentary is makes you fall in love with the, with the mother and the father in that scenario and understand that they're protecting their children from their business. Understand that uh, to label them as pornographers and people that are, that are uh, in charge of obscenity and that are polluting America's uh, uh, values uh, just would not be a logical way to view these people. And the documentary does that in a very, uh, uh, like, like succinct and uh, unobtrusive way. I fall in love with that family having nothing to do with anything that anybody says in an interview other than the, the two people talking about running a porn store. Whereas this documentary is very in your face. It's, it's people telling you directly that Joe didn't know what he was doing when he was running for governor. Joe doesn't know anything about politics. Joe probably still doesn't know what the Libertarian Party is. We got Carol Baskin on camera talking about how much of a piece of shit it, Joe is. We got Joe talking about how much of a piece of shit Carol is. We got Jeff Lowe talking about how much of a piece of shit everybody is, about how he's the greatest dude. And that he should be the only one involved. Uh, and you just got all these people talking directly about Joe's neglect. And it's just not really the way you're supposed to tell a story. Again, this is this is closer to a reality show. And that's the perspective we take in our first debate episode is all of the shit talking, all of the like slight, all of the 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 slander that everybody's throwing back and forth at each other is more of a like forced situation like a reality show where they pull me aside and they say hey this guy just took your girl what are you going to do about it and you go you know what that's what he wants that's that's not that's got nothing to do with me that's not for me but you could feel the documentary filmmaker in this situation not being sufficed with that uh the documentary filmmaker over four years said you know what we are going to make these people talk shit about each other we are going to create a drama like no other and we're going to sell the fuck out of it to netflix and that's what they did here and that's what this that's what this whole thing is um so that's kind of what episode five is episode five is a big mess 
Um, and it's eerie. If you watch the, the middle part of the episode that's about the presidential campaign and the, gub, the gubernatorial campaign, um, it does. It feels like a Trump campaign um, to call it make make uh, what is it? Make America exotic again is not at all um, off the charts. It's not at all uh, like crazy or uh what's the word i want it's not even hyperbole it's it's pretty on the nose um and i think i've said it at some point and if i haven't i'm going to declare it now uh if joe gets out of prison uh or he gets pardoned which by the way donald trump has said he would pardon joe exotic uh maybe as a joke but then again we thought everything trump was saying was a joke but then he told america to drink bleach um and put UV rays up their butt. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. But uh, it would not be out of question, uh, and it would not be out of the realm of what we would do in this country, apparently, to vote for a Joe Exotic. Uh, There's something about these people that makes us feel better about ourselves. And as Americans who we all think we are the greatest, and I think we are, Uh, But to see someone less than us on 90 Day Fiance, on uh, Vanderpump Rules, on Tiger King, as the president, I think we feel good. I think we feel better. I think we feel um, in a lot of times and in a lot of ways we feel demeaned by people who are smarter than us and we feel inferior and nobody wants to feel that. Uh, I've only felt dumb a couple times in my life and they stand out. One of them was the first day I tried to be a server. I had no idea what I was doing and I felt like an absolute moron and I would not wish anybody to feel that way ever again. Um, uh, and then another time was when I uh, walked into my college dorm and I saw everyone that I knew. I lived in a pretty particular dorm of brilliant people. And it wasn't by choice. They didn't put me because I was brilliant. These people were brilliant. And they were all watching Moulin Rouge and laughing hysterically. And then I realized I watched Moulin Rouge like thinking it was a drama. But meanwhile, it was a, it literally was a... Um, What's the word? The whole the whole thing was rooted in sarcasm and allegory and hyperbole and all of the other things. And maybe I still don't understand uh, Moulin Rouge because that description was was uh, was wildly ineffective. But my point is, I walked in and all these people were laughing at this movie that I didn't think or know was funny. And all of a sudden I knew, oh, no, these people know what they're talking about. And I don't. And this probably is very funny. And I'm an idiot. So those are the times. And none of us want to feel dumb. None of us want to feel like idiots. No one wants a president to make us feel less than. Um I, we're going to see more and more of these these Joe Exotics, more and more of these Donald Trumps, more and more of these The Rocks, Kevin Hart's. These are the people that are going to start running for president, Kanye West, and they're actually going to get a lot closer than we ever thought that they would. And that's one of the scariest things that comes from this episode of the pod, or, uh, of the of the documentary, is that uh, the Joe Exotic presidential run. Though we weren't ready for it back then is a very real possibility now. Obviously, look, if he goes to prison and he doesn't get pardoned, he can't run for president. That's just the way the system works. But the Joe Exotic, the symbol of Joe Exotic exists. And that type of human being can get that close to the presidency. Possibly. Uh, So those are my thoughts. That's how I feel about the thing. Uh, If you guys have questions, comments, uh, check me out. Dan at tigercrisis.com. Uh, I got a letter from uh, from a listener the other day. I wanted to, to get involved here and, and, and read it. Um, so every week we put out an episode uh, of, uh, and a debate episode on top of it. And, um, and one of the things that we try and highlight if we can is some of the stuff that's happening uh, across the board uh, that that could be like debate topics. Anyway, one of the one of the the side notes on the whole thing was um, whether or not you could get away with murder and what it would take. Because we're looking at Carol Baskin and she's going out of the out of the way uh, to to talk about um, how she uh, how she is. I'm trying to access this email. Apologize. Um, so we, she goes out of her way about trying to um, 
defend herself in the in the murder and all these sorts of things. And then what we find out through that episode of the of the thing is that uh, it seems pretty easy actually to murder somebody and get away with it if you just take the right steps. And so on the heels of that discussion, I got an email from a friend who listens to the podcast who basically said, look, um, my mother, my stepmother murdered my father and we're in that same situation. And I know she did it and I can't prove it. And we're in a situation where um, we just, I just have to look at her and and act like everything is cool. Uh, apologies, I can't find this this email at the moment, but that was sort of the crux of the thing. So I want to hear from you guys if you have some thoughts about marrying someone who you have no, um, if you that you have no uh, uh, attraction to, if you think that you can do that, if you think that that's ludicrous, or that everybody who's married is obviously very much attracted to their people. Let me know, uh, Dan at TigerCrisis dot com. Let's get the words out. Thank you guys for listening and watching. Uh, I know the first couple episodes dragged a little bit and uh, uh, we didn't really have our footing, but I hope we're there now and I hope you guys appreciate what we're doing. We, uh, we're made on Anchor app, uh, which is a free app that you can make your podcast uh, right off your phone. That's not how we're doing it, but that's not to say that you shouldn't do it that way. We have some content on YouTube if you want to check that out. We put out an extra episode every week that has a debate about uh, something that comes up in the episode. We try to be a little fun, funny, and speculative about the episodes. Uh, uh, so don't take it too seriously. Uh, the Trump supporters who are getting freaked out, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. We'll move on beyond this. Thank you guys for listening and watching. My name is Dan Frigolette. Please check out my content. Check out some of the, the things that are coming up. We're going to do some live Zoom shows with stand-up comedians in New York City. So please support us. Thank you so much.